This is Gerald Kaufman, father of the house, and you're watching Casual Politics. Welcome to Casual Politics, uh, Sir Gerald Kaufman. Thank you very much for accepting my request, and I'm very grateful to you. It's a you, pleasure. You need no introduction. And very recently, please allow me to congratulate you for your appointment as father of the house. And, uh, and first, let me ask you, how exciting was for you to uh, now to replace Sir Edward Heath, Peter Tapsell, Alan Milburn, and to get that t honorary title in Parliament? It was very exciting and people have been very nice to me about it. They've been extremely nice to me about it. And so it's a very nice time in my life. And how disappointing was for you to become father of the house and not to see your party as part of government? Very disappointing indeed. I didn't expect the Conservatives to win a majority. I thought that it was possible they might be the largest single party. I thought it was possible that Labour might be the largest single party. I didn't expect a Conservative majority, so it was quite a shock. And what went wrong in your opinion that especially you did very poorly in England and South England and Scotland? We failed to make contact with the people whose votes we needed. Where we were safe, we often became safer. My seat had the biggest majority in its whole history. But we did not make contact with the people whose votes we needed if we were going to gain seats. It was a failed campaign. And some people, they um they were saying that um, Labour was too right-wing Scotland and too left-wing in England. Which side are you on? I don't believe that is necessarily the case. I don't think it's as simple as that. If Labour had been regarded as a viable alternative government, we wouldn't have had the wipeout in Scotland and we wouldn't have had the wipeout in South East England, South West England, and the Midlands as well. It was a very bad defeat, and there's no point in pretending. And um, you, um, do you think that the messenger actually was, um, that we, you had the right messenger, but uh, the wrong messenger and the right message? No, we had the wrong message. We had the wrong message. For the area that I represent, we had the right message. But we go on winning my seat and it doesn't carry with it a Labour majority. We did not have the right message for the overwhelming majority of the country because we did not get sufficient votes. We got 30% out of 100%. And there are some parallels to 1983 general election because you lost some that you did that poorly was in 1983 when Michael Foote was uh, the leader of your party and then you, you said that it was the longest suicide note in history. And do you think that this manifesto that you had for the general election, it was as well the longest suicide No, no. It, it, it was a peculiar manifesto. I read it from beginning to end. And there were parts I agreed with and there were parts I didn't agree with. It wasn't a suicidal manifesto, though it ended in our being slaughtered. It wasn't as bad as 83 and the election result wasn't as bad as 83, but it was bad enough. And Harriet Harman, a week ago, uh, the in interim leader said that yeah, even Labour supporters, they were relieved that Labour lost the Conservatives. Do you agree with her? They didn't like that in my constituency. Yeah. In my constituency, Labour supporters and 67% of the people who voted were Labour supporters. My supporters wanted a Labour government, so I wouldn't agree with Harriet on that. And have you decided which uh, candidate will you back to become no, leader? Not I yet. Haven't. 
I, the, I didn't nominate anybody yes. b because there was nobody I looked at and I thought, that's the one, that's the one. In 1994, when Tony Blair was the candidate, I knew that was the one. And he won the three, three of the biggest victories, including the two biggest victories that Labour has ever won at, in its whole history. No, I decided to keep out of candidate nomination. And so, uh, so you didn't vote for any any of the candidates. Do you do you agree with Frank Fu because he wrote yesterday? He wrote a letter and urged your party to put in place as soon as possible a, a mechanism to change the leader. Do you agree with him? No, I don't. Frank asked me to sign that letter, and I said no. I don't. Why want you didn't it. sign it? Be because I think that that's too simplistic, and it's impossible to anticipate the future. We are less ruthless with our leaders than the Conservatives. Ian Duncan Smith was leader of the Conservative Party and they got rid of him without him even leading them into an election because they thought he was a loser. I don't know what's going to come in the next four years, four and a half years, and it's impossible to anticipate. But I thought that what Frank was proposing was too simple. So I, he asked me if I would sign that letter, and I said, no, I shan't. But Conservatives, they got a good reputation for changing their leaders. They did it in 1990, and then they won a landslide majority in 1992. So uh, why then Labour would not do it? Because Labour isn't like that. It's a peculiar fact that the only leader that the Labour Party has ever got rid of was Tony Blair who was the most successful leader of the Labour Party. It was the <laughs> Chancellor who got rid of him, it was not even the party. It, it, it was done by manoeuvring, and that manoeuvring led him to resign sooner than he had intended to resign. It was an act of utter and total folly. We, we'll, we'll see what happens as the years go by. I very much hope that in September, the party will elect somebody who can win. We'll have to wait and see. And what does your party lack that you can't reach out to the wider electorate? We did not understand 70% of the voters. That's the problem, and it's a very, very, very serious problem. And we have to learn and we can't take too long. We have to learn how to reach out to the people who voted for us in 1997 and voted for us in 2001 and voted for us in 2005, but didn't vote for us in 2010 and didn't vote for us in May of this year. And do you think that it was wrong to defend the poorest and to offend the riches and to, and to ignore those in the middle. It's the, those in the middle who decide elections. The people in my constituency are not well off, but the people in my constituency have elected me 12 times. So Since that's, 1970. That's very, very nice for me, but it doesn't confront the problems of how to win in Lincolnshire, how to win in Warwickshire, how to win in Kent, how to win in Hampshire, how to win in Scotland. We have not got that right and we've got to work to find out how to get it right and it's not simple. You talked about Scotland, do you think that uh, Tory's message, which was that your party will form a coalition with SNP, did it cut, cut through across the country? I thought it was a very, very clever manoeuvre, and I think it played its part in their victory and in our defeat. And now Europe, do you think that your party should, um, should run its own campaign over the EU referendum? I don't believe there should be a referendum. I think it's nonsense to have a referendum, but we've got a bill going through Parliament to make staging a referendum law. 
I believe that the Labour Party ought to campaign for us to stay in Europe. I think that the Conservative government may well campaign that as well. But since you're asking about the Labour Party, I think the Labour Party ought to campaign for us to remain in the European Union. This country's whole prosperity depends upon trade with the countries in the European Union. But why didn't people, the, in your opinion, they should not have a voice? Because last time it was in 1975. 40 years on, why then still they can't have I a don't voice? think that we should do that. This is not, or ought not to be, a referendum country. This is a parliamentary democracy. And decisions ought to be made not by going out and having a simplified campaign with a yes or a no. Decisions ought to be made in Parliament after careful debate. And it was actually um, t Tony Benn who was in favour and then pressed um, Harold Wilson in 1975 to put a referendum. And um, so if Britain decides to leave the European Union, do you think that it, it would produce a clamour over another's uh, independence in Scotland? I don't know about that. What I do know is that if we decide to leave the European Union, it will be an act of suicide like in 1983. And uh, do you think that David Cameron is walking in um, Harold Wilson's footsteps? Because um, he, he's saying that he already got his, uh, he already um, said that he already got his achievements, uh, renegotiations, like as Harold Wilson did in 1975. And we just discovered after the referendum that there were no uh, renegotiations in real terms. You're right, there weren't any real negotiations. Harold Wilson went through a procedure in order to have something to offer to the electorate and he decided to have a referendum, have a referendum to settle it. And he had the referendum and the vote was two to one in favour of staying in what was then the European Economic Community. I think that was it. I don't think we should have this referendum. But if we do have the referendum, and it looks as though we shall, then what we will have to do is campaign to stay in, because otherwise this country will be ruined. And King Clark, a Europhile um, backbencher, he was saying, and the veteran Conservative MP was saying that if there are any renegotiations, but in any case, in any terms, there should be no repatriation of powers from Brussels, for instance, in fishing. Um, um, and trade. Do you agree with him? I think he's basically right, yes. He's always been a very ardent pro-European and of course he was a cabinet minister until recently. Until I, think his approach is, I think his approach is a sensible approach. And for um, Scotland, are you in favour of a full fiscal aut autonomy to Scotland? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. I don't think that we should fall over our heads to appease the Scots because they voted for the Scottish Nationalists. We should do what is right for the United Kingdom. There are four countries in the United Kingdom. Scotland is one of them. And are you in favour of Chancellor's uh, Northern Powerhouse to give more powers to your constituency to Ma Manchester? I'm not in favour of this kind of devolution that this government is trying to implement because it's simply passing on responsibility without providing the money. Also, it's not democratic. I like elected government. And uh, do you think that we should devolve more powers to every region in England equ equally or not? No. I've, I've got a big slogan which I've had in politics and that is if it, ain't, if it ain't broke don't fix it and basically I don't think it's broke. I, d I think the way this country operates is a pretty good way. It's just that the policies... But people they think that there has been too much power centralised in Westminster. How do you know? Bec because uh, they are disillusioned. But they how don't do you know? 
they can be disillusioned. The turnout, it was still very low. It was below 70% in 1965. The, the turnout was was 98% um, for both parties. Uh, I, you may well be right, but we don't know what people want. What we do is put programs before the electorate in a general election that one party or another generally sometimes doesn't get a majority, but one party will get a majority and will seek to carry out its policies. I don't believe in meddling for no good reason. So that that's your position. And um, so, um, so do you, what do you foresee for the future of the United Kingdom as a whole? We go on as we are. It's not the structure. It's not the structure that's the problem. The issue is the policies and how you legislate in order to make this a more efficient, more prosperous, more comfortable and more caring country. That's what we need. And how could we do to engage more people in politics? By making politicians seem aware of the needs of people and saying to people, come and join us, come and be part of us. That's the job of the Labour Party in this Parliament. If we don't do that, we're not going to win next time. But why? We, we don't, in Parliament, we don't produce Michael Foots anymore, Tony Benz, Willie Whitelows, Lord Hayshams, or Gerald Kaufman's anymore. Look, Michael Foote was a very, very good parliamentary speaker. Few better. But he wasn't a good minister. He wasn't, and he certainly wasn't a good leader. It is perfectly true that the level of oratory in the House of Commons is very low now. And there was a time when one had a considerable number of people you might have agreed with them or you might not have agreed with them, who could express themselves attractively, convincingly. Enoch Powell, and I didn't agree with the word that Enoch Powell said, yeah, yeah. but Enoch Powell could express himself <coughs> in a very, very eloquent way. Michael Foote could express himself in a very eloquent way. <coughs> We don't have people like that now. And what could we do to have actually people like that? I don't know. They evolve. They arrive. You see them when they're there. People like Churchill. People like Harold Wilson. Those people emerge. But it's not simply a question of making an eloquent speech in the House of Commons. That's not so difficult to do. I was able to do that. What is important is communicating with tens of millions of people in the country. And what has changed in your party since you first in, entered in, in Parliament in 1970? What are the ma major changes in your party? People are too personally ambitious. When I was elected to Parliament in 1970, obviously people were ambitious because they, otherwise they wouldn't have gone successfully through the process of being chosen as parliamentary candidates in winnable seats. But what they wanted to do is to use Parliament to achieve objectives. Now, I'm very sorry to say there are too many people who want to be in Parliament in order to sit on a front bench and have some form of power. Do power is important for political parties. Individuals should have objectives of attainment. And how your party could again speak out to people's ins inspiration? That is something we're going to have to work out and we're going to have to start working it out pretty quickly. We've got the leadership and deputy leadership election, which will conclude in September. We shall have to see who wins. 
And when we see who wins, I'll know whether we can do it. And you said that you, you didn't vote for any of the candidates. Who do you think, in your opinion, that should, sh should have put his name to become a candidate? It's very difficult to say. If I saw in the Parliamentary Labour Party someone who was clearly an outstanding person, I'd go for that person. That's what I did with Blair. I spotted Blair from the beginning as somebody who could be an incredibly successful politician. Such people are rare. Wilson was like that as well. Not the same kind of person, but the, the same kind of appeal. I don't see anybody quite like that now. And now, Father of the House, is it Gerald Kaufman's last stand in Parliament? I'm sorry? Is it now Father of the House, is it Gerald Kaufman's last stand in Parliament? I'm not understanding your <laughs> question. Is it, is it your... Does it mean that this is the end for your parliamentary career, Father of the House? We shall have to see. <laughs> we shall have to see. As long as I'm in Parliament, if I stand at the next election, and if I win at the next election, I'll go on being father of the house. <laughs> That's <laughs> something that you carry with you. Oh, yes. That what I'm going to do, I'm not going to decide now. There's another five years to go before I need to make <laughs> up my mind. <laughs> and my last question, as I know that you've got a lot of engagements for the rest of today, um, what are the challenges that do you think that uh, the Conservative government will face over the next five years? How to achieve prosperity, how to distribute prosperity evenly across the country so that business and enterprise can provide jobs to millions of people so that the Conservative government can make this country A, a more prosperous country and B, a more equal country so that people of the kind who live in my constituency do not feel that a government doesn't care about them. And we shall wait and see. We shall wait and see. <laughs> it was a great pleasure, Senator okay. Father of the House. Thank, Thank you very you. much.